Tales Under a Broken Sky Episode 13 The Witches of Kildanu Part 1 As evil things often do, it started with prejudice. There was no logic to it, just a burning anger that flows through the veins of the self-righteous. There was no other reason for William Burns to kill his wife and dispose of her body in the lake, weighed down by a bag of scrap metal tied to her ankles. And that one act of evil, rooted in fear and ignorance, led to everything that came after. Twenty forty seven. 27th of June. James Galvin is sitting in his sunroom, a glass of whiskey in hand, flicking nonchalantly through the pages of a book when his personal phone rings. Groaning, he sets the glass down and shoves the book down between his leg and the side of the armchair. William Burns? What's he doing calling me at this hour? Reluctantly, he picks up the phone and answers. Hello, William? James, hi, look, I'm sorry to be bothering you this late, but I didn't know who else to call. I don't even know if I should be calling anyone. He pauses, the silence reluctant and tense. Take a breath, William. Now, tell me, what's going on? I don't know if it's anything or not, James. But Julia, Julia, Julia didn't come home for dinner tonight. James can hear the barely restrained emotion in James's voice as he is talking. You sure she didn't have plans, Will? Christ. Things like that didn't just happen around the town. Yeah, I'm sure. She went into town to pick up some things for dinner. I was out in my workshop, finishing up a project for the Connors. Uh, I lost track of time. I didn't realise how late it was until I finished. When I went to look for her, She wasn't home. Her car was gone, Jim. I don't think she ever made it home. James groaned softly to himself. This was meant to be the easy time of his life, moving back home after spending most of his career in the city. And Julia. She was close friends with his own wife, and he himself had known William since they were children. Shit. William, I don't know what to say. No messages on your phone or anything? Nothing, Jim. I'm going to head along the road back to town now. See if maybe she'd trouble with a car. There haven't been any reports of accidents, have there? No. No accidents. Nothing like that tonight. I just sat down with a glass of that single malt you got me last Christmas. Give me ten minutes and I'll head into town with you. Meet you by the bridge? Sure. Thanks, Jim. I'm not sure what I'd do if something happened to her. We'll find her, Will. People around here, they don't just go missing. It's not the sort of thing that happens. It's probably just car trouble. There's that black spot for phone coverage a few miles from your house. Okay, Jim, you're probably right. I'll see you by the bridge. James puts the phone down and leans back in his chair, closing his eyes and taking a deep breath. If Julia did have car trouble, she could have easily walked home or back into town. She was fit and active and regularly made that walk but that wasn't something he was going to say to his friend over the phone. So, accident maybe? He didn't want to think about the worst case scenarios. He'd moved home to get away from all of that. Shit. James groans as he stands. So much for quiet night. Grabbing his keys and shrugging on a jacket, he heads towards the door. He doesn't like where this is going. Not one bit. Twenty one oh five, twenty seventh of June. William is already waiting by the bridge when James pulls in. The man is pacing back and forth alongside his car, wringing his hands in agitation. He stops when James pulls in and moves forward to meet him as he steps out of the car. James, thank God. We need to hurry. I almost didn't wait for you. What if there was an accident? Take a breath, Will. We can't be any help to her if you don't have your head on straight. We'll take my car, follow the route back into town. 
I'm sure we'll find her before long. William walks around to the passenger side as James sits back into his car. He keys the ignition and pulls back out onto the road. Keep an eye out for any signs she might have gone off-road. William nods distracted, rubbing his hands together anxiously and peering out the window. James drives on in silence. Worry starts to grow in James's gut as they approach the town. No sign of Julia or her car. The evening is closing in and he doesn't fancy their chances of finding her in the dark. He stops the car at the edge of the town and sits back in his seat with a deep sigh. William looks over at him, worry creasing his face. Oh fuck, Jim. What do we do? James turns and shakes his head. I'm going to call into the office. Tom is on duty tonight, and he'll call in the rest of the squad. We'll start at the grocery store and work our way out from there, door to door if we have to. You'll have to come back to the station with me to make an official statement first. The others will start the search, and we'll join them once we finish. I should be out there, Jim. William slams his hands on the dashboard in frustration. Damn it, she's my wife. I should be out there looking for her. I need you to keep a cool head, Will. If I need to expand the search outside the town, I'm going to need more details than you've given me. This won't take long, and then after, we'll go right back out there. I'll be there all night with you if I have to. William's head sinks into his hands, his chest heaving with sobs. James looks on awkwardly one hand on his distraught friend's shoulder. He wishes he could be more reassuring, but all of his instincts and experience are telling him that something terrible has happened. 2212, 27th of June. The news spreads like wildfire through the town as soon as the local police start canvassing. When James emerges from the interview room, the switchboard has been inundated with calls from concerned locals for over an hour. Taking a moment to regain his composure, William's statement was one of the hardest interviews he had ever done. He stands by the window, wiping his brow. Hanging up the phone, Sarah looks up at him with hollow eyes. Does anyone have any information? James's voice is tired as he walks across to her desk. She shakes her head. Her eyes are red, and he can see barely held back tears welling in the corners. I need you to keep answering, Sarah. Try to keep it short. Find out if they saw Julia today. If not, politely end the call and move on. I've got Martin out back trying to trace her movements on the public camera system. But that's limited to the town centre. I need a witness, preferably more than one. She nods at him, and taking a deep breath, she starts to answer the incoming lines again. Christ, this was going to be tough on everyone. It was a small community, and nothing like this ever happened. No one was going to be getting much sleep tonight. William emerges from the toilet and walks towards James, his eyes raw. A defeated man, if he had ever seen one. Look, William, I know you want to be out there. But if you need to go home, no one would blame you. Get some rest and we can pick this up again in the morning. I have the whole force out there looking now as it is. One extra body won't make much of a difference. William looks him in the eye for the first time that evening and shakes his head curtly. No, she's been my wife for 30 years, Jim. I need to be out there. All right, come on then. We'll grab some coffee at the petrol station and get back out there. It's going to be a long night. 2230, 27th of June. The car park at the grocery store is in chaos when they arrive. It looks to James like half the town had come out to give statements. They are clustered in groups, looking around anxiously and several of his officers have already started to take individuals aside for questioning. Good. Maybe we can finally start putting together her movements now. He turns to William, quietly staring out the window, a lost look in his eyes. You don't have to go out there if you don't want to. It can be hard to meet people when something like this is going on. The stubborn look returns to William's face again, and he shakes his head. No. One of them might know something. I need to be out there. William opens the door impulsively, as if afraid that any hesitation might cause him to change his mind and walk stiffly towards the nearest group. James hurries out of the car after him. Several of the nearby group see William step out of the car and he is immediately inundated with well wishes and hugs. 
James looks around and spots Tom, momentarily grateful for the distraction so he can get an uncensored report on the state of play. Tom, he waves towards his deputy as Tom flips his notebook closed and thanks a young lady in a store uniform. He nods back towards James, thanks her again and hurries across the car park. Where are we at? So far, a whole lot of nothing. I've eight witnesses here who saw her shopping. They all placed her in the store around 5 p.m. The manager checked their cameras and she checked out at 1727. Deirdre Kelly waved to her as she left the car park about five minutes after that, but that seems to be the last contact anyone had with her. Julie was in her car. Tom nods. Her and Deirdre had a brief chat at the checkout. Deirdre said it looked like she was picking up a few things for dinner, meat, vegetables, that sort of thing. I managed to get a copy of the receipt from the manager. Nothing on it that would scream leaving town. Mostly fresh products that would need refrigeration and or cooking. I've known William and Julia for years. I know people can bury their heads when it comes to their neighbours' personal problems. But there hasn't been a whiff of trouble between the two of them in all the years I've known them. No sign of anything on the road to town? Tom looks tired as he speaks. He'd been on the force for ten years. And nothing even close to this had happened in that time. No, nothing. No sign she went off the road either. We didn't have time to check any of the side roads leading to the forest or the lake. That'll be our next port of call. But doesn't look like she ran into car trouble or had an accident. How do you want us to proceed? There's just five of us and William, I suppose. He's still refusing to go home. Maybe a few of the more reliable locals, if we can swing it. I need one of the lads to stay here. Keep taking statements from anyone with anything that remotely seems like information. David, maybe. He's got a good head for detail, and he's a good manner about him. The rest of us will have a lot of ground to cover. We'll pair off, delegate out sets of roads and trails to cover. Check-ins every 15 minutes. It's going to be a long night. 3.25, 28 of June. James is leaning against the side of his car, half-heartedly sipping a lukewarm coffee from a paper cup when his phone buzzes in his pocket. Tom. He sighs. So far, the search had turned up nothing. Rolling his shoulders, he stares up at the overcast sky as he answers. Tom. Jim, you're going to want to see this. We found her car. Tom's words jerk him awake, and he pushes himself away from the car. Where? Is it empty? His heart is racing, and he fumbles with his keys as he slides in behind the wheel. No one in the front or back, but we haven't checked the boot yet. We wanted to wait for you. None of us have any experience with this type of investigation, and we don't want to mess anything up. Where are you right now? We're about 15 minutes from the lake, up the small road leading towards the old McCarthy place. I'll be right there. Don't leave the scene, and don't touch anything. James hangs up the phone and pulls out of the petrol station. This was the first thing close to a break they'd had in Julia's disappearance. Possibilities storm around in his head, memories of old cases flooding his thoughts. His heart sinks at the thought of what he might or might not find when he examines the car. James glances down at his phone, considering a call to William. Surely he deserves to know. But he shakes his head as he thinks better of it. No point in worrying the man until he has more info. It could be a dead end. It could be a genuine lead. It could be. The last possibility settles uneasily in his gut. Anyway, at this hour, he didn't think William was in any fit state to be driving on the dark rural roads. There had already been a smell on his breath during the interview, and whoever had brought those bottles of whiskey out for the search party had done more harm than good in his book. He turns off the main road, and his tires rumble as they transition to the rough boreen leading up to the old farm. He didn't like to use the term abandoned, especially as the town didn't have a single vacant lot or run-down building, a miracle in itself in the current economy. But the last of the McCarthys had moved away a few years back, and the farm had been empty since. James slows to a stop when he spots the lights of Tom's car up ahead, parked in the middle of the small road. He swallows the last of his now cold coffee and pulls the zip on his jacket up to his chin. He shivers as he approaches his deputy. Tom nods to him in greeting, and James follows Tom's gaze into the trees. It wasn't an accident anyway, James thinks as he surveys the scene. 
the car is undamaged and the lack of disturbance on the ground indicates it had been parked carefully in the space between the trees. He flicks on his torch and peers through the windows. No sign of a struggle inside either. The keys are still in the ignition. He slips on a pair of latex gloves from his pocket and eases open the driver's side door. The door opens with a loud thunk in the stillness of the evening. He feels his shoulders tense as he reaches in and removes the keys from the ignition. Fuck, I really don't want to be doing this. He thumbs the boot release button on the key fob, flinching as the latch disengages. He returns the keys to the ignition and walks around to the rear of the car. Tom is staring blankly at the boot, his eyes wide and face pale. James doesn't blame him. This was the last thing he wanted to be doing tonight. He hooks his fingers under the lid and takes a deep breath to steady himself. Exhaling, he pulls up and prepares himself for the worst. Two bags of groceries. James stifles a laugh of relief, then sighs as the reality sinks in. Another dead end. Turning back to Tom, who is visibly relieved behind him, he puts as much effort as he can muster into keeping his voice calm. We need to get the area blocked off. No one in or out until I can get a forensics team down here tomorrow. Tom blanched. I was hoping this was a good sign. James shakes his head in response. Christ, this was going to be a long night. It was over a month before the body was finally found. Fourteen, fifteen, third of August. Jake Horgan rests his feet on the side of the boat and leans back in his seat, the fishing rod held loosely in his left hand. He doesn't really expect to catch anything, but that wasn't really the point of their excursion anyway. It was quiet out here, nothing but the languorous lapping of the water against the hull and the slow wheeling of birds in the distance. Even the boisterous laughter of his friends couldn't disturb the peace he felt out on the lake. Someone taps his right shoulder, and he holds up his hand as they pass a half-smoked joint forward. He slips it between his lips and lets his hand fall back on his lap as he inhales the sweet smoke. He closes his eyes and turns his head up to the wind, feeling the gentle breeze whispering against his skin. He can't wait to get away. Just another few weeks left of the summer, and he will be on his way again, back to university and away from the stifling atmosphere of the town. He knows that he shouldn't be complaining. There are worse places to grow up. Kildanu was just one of those towns where nothing of any interest ever seemed to happen. It was quiet, peaceful and scenic. What most people would probably think of as idyllic. It just didn't suit him. He takes another drag and reaches to pass it back to the others when something tugs at his line. Holy shit! The curse comes out in a mumble as he hastily shoved the joint back into his mouth and grabs the rod with both hands. Hey lads, looks like Jake has more luck with fish than with women. The others laugh behind him at the quip. Fuck you, Sean. How'd you hurt your wrist again? Now get up here and help. This wanker's putting up a fight. Jake can imagine the gesture his friend makes behind him as the others burst into laughter again. But Sean is in the seat next to him almost immediately. Jesus, Jake, I didn't think you'd gone that soft in the city. But he cuts off as he sees the tension in Jake's arms. I'm not sure it's a fish anymore, Sean. I can't reel the damn thing in, but it's not pulling against the line either. I think the hook might have caught on something. Here, let me have a go. Sean reaches across and Jake passes him the rod. Bracing his feet against the side of the boat, he pushes back as he cranks the reel. Sean works the line carefully adding and releasing tension as he pulls, hoping to work the hook free from whatever it had snagged on. Oh, for fuck's sake, this was meant to be a relaxing afternoon. Sean pulls hard on the line again, his impatience getting the better of him. Whatever is snagged on the lure holds for another moment before jerking free, and Sean tumbles backwards across the deck as the tension is released. Groaning, Sean hands the rod back to Jake and gestures to him to pass over the joint. Reel that fucker in, and let's hope you haven't lost my fly. He takes a deep drag as he shoots the others a scowl. The laughter dies down, and he lies back with his feet dangling over the side, as if that was always his intention, smoke billowing up from his mouth. Jake turns back to the lake, 
and slowly cranks the line back in, not wanting to have it snag again. It finally breaks the surface and he reels it in, letting the matted mass at the end of the line dangle in front of his face. What the f- Jake trails off numbly as he examines the mass of hair hanging from the line. Realising what he's looking at, his face turns white and he drops the rod and the macabre catch onto the bottom of the boat. He stumbles backwards, tripping over Sean and lands hard on his ass next to his friend. The others start to laugh again, but they stop abruptly when they see the look of wide-eyed horror on his face. Sean thumps him on the arm and takes another drag. What the fuck, mate? Jake gestures impatiently for the joint his eyes still fixed on the dripping mass of hair. Sean raises an eyebrow and looks begrudgingly at the stub in his hand. Just fucking give it to me, Sean. Paddy, make yourself useful and roll another one. What's gotten into you, Jake? The impatience on Sean's face is replaced by a look of concern as he recognises the look of fear on Jake's face. He passes the joint over and pushes himself to his feet. Picking up the rod and holding the waterlog catch in front of his face, Sean starts to gag as he realises what is dangling at the end of the line. He flings the rod down, muttering a string of curses under his breath. Paddy, make that too. Steve, do you have reception on your phone? Call Jimmy Galvin and tell him to get his ass down here now. The police? What the fuck did you lads reel in? Just do it, Steve. Sean sits back down with a thump, his eyes still fixed on the mass of matted hair and rotting scalp they had just pulled from the lake. Welcome, folks, to episode 13 of Tales Under a Broken Sky. I am your host, Keith, and I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Originally, I had planned to release this new story further on in the running order of the show, but life and editing conspired against me. And when it came time to record episode 13, I didn't have the previously planned upon story in a place I was happy with. I've been working on The Witches of Killed Anew for a few months now, and I had the first chapter in a pretty good place, so I decided to change things around a bit in my planning. That being said, when I sat down to script this episode, I had an inexplicable urge to change the tense of the narrative, which involved a lot of rewriting. So yeah, more work than I had originally intended on a project that I initially thought was ready to go. The idea for this story originally came during a writing workshop uh, through one of those prompt exercises where you're given a few minutes to write and just see where you end up. The result, what was initially intended to be a short story, was fast-paced, writing in the tone and voice of someone recollecting events rather than an evolving story. About 2,000 words in though, a few of the characters began to develop their own voices and increasingly deserve larger roles than names just simply mentioned in passing. This story sits in a similar place to The Possessed, in that it is a very much in progress piece of writing. I'm still working out where it's going, and there are a few characters I want to introduce that I still haven't fully developed. Similarly, I'm not sure of the length of the work. It is certainly much larger than a short story, so at minimum, I'm envisioning it as a novella, although With the viewpoints I want to work in, this could be longer, and to be honest only time will tell. I don't want to give too much away, although the title kind of gives away a few things in itself. At the core of the story, I wanted to explore the impact of a literal witch hunt set in the modern day. How fear and panic can turn even the most rational of people on their heads, and how relationships are impacted by strong emotions and divided opinions. It is set in a fictional town, Kildanu, roughly located in Ireland. And I say roughly because it isn't necessarily. A lot of the terms I use are a lot more universal, especially with regards to organisations, people and places. Although the language and mannerisms are akin to what I myself grew up with. Currently, in my head anyway, the place exists separate from the world in its own little place in the universe. 
There are places outside the town, but we won't be visiting those. Call it a microcosm, if you will. You know, if, if we want to use flowery language and all that. The name of the town itself, and I'll leave the interpretation aside for now, took some time in itself, drawing from the anglicisation of Irish place names under British rule, and has meaning of its own when the roots of the name are looked at. And it does indeed have a direct relationship to what happens later on in the story. But that's it for now. I don't really want to give too much away at this early stage, because where would be the fun in that? Until next time. Thank you for listening to episode 13 of Tales Under a Broken Sky. I hope you enjoyed this week's production as much as I enjoyed writing and recording it. If you did enjoy it, please consider subscribing to the podcast on your platform of choice and leaving a rating and or review. Thank you again for your time. Stay tuned to hear a brief trailer for the next episode. Tales Under a Broken Sky Episode 14 The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe True. Nervous. Very, very dreadfully nervous I had been. And am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses. Not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain. But once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object, there was none. Passion, there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold, I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. One of his eyes resembled that of a vulture. A pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man. And thus, rid myself of the eye.